Uh, so yes, I'm a director of uh, IPSER at MSU, which houses the Michigan Political Leadership Program, where we have uh, several county commissioners making their uh, way through. Uh, we also house the Survey Research Office, so I can tell you how that part of the, the world is going. Uh, and uh, I am a political science professor, so I will overwhelm you with graphs. Fair warning. <laughs> so. Uh, this is the overall um, uh, performance of the Democratic and Republican parties uh, over time. Uh, the solid line is all state houses, uh, lower chambers put together. Uh, higher means Democrats are gaining, lower means Republicans are gaining. Uh, the uh, dashed line is uh, the performance in the U.S. House of Representatives. So uh, anything you notice about the graph? Anything jump out? It, it's very jagged, right? Whoever wins one election is immediately favored to lose the next election. That's especially true in the midterms following uh, a new president's uh, inauguration. Anything else you notice? The lines are extremely correlated, right? You might see a little bit uh, uh, more uh, variation in the U.S. House versus the state houses. Um, but uh, we have nationalized elections. Uh, that is, uh, whatever's happening uh, at the national level is going to be reflected uh, in uh, the states as well. And uh, just to make this a little bit more depressing, uh, this is uh, trying to predict someone's uh, vote for state legislature. And I've done that with two different variables. I can either ask them, how, what, how do you think things are going in the state legislature down the street? And then try to predict whether they're going to vote for the majority party, the Republicans, in the majority party candidate, the Republican candidate, in their state legislative race. And it turns out that uh, gets me a little bit of... I don't know if I have a pointer here, but a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge. That is, if they really disapprove of what's going on in the state legislature versus they really approve, they might go from 50% to 60% likely to support the Republican candidate for state legislature. Okay? Well, the uh, dash line is approval or disapproval of the president of the United States and whether they are going to support the uh, party of the president in that state legislative race, the Democratic candidate uh, in this case. And there, my strong disapproval versus my strong approval goes from 20% to 80%. That is, if you want to know how somebody's going to vote for a state legislative candidate, you don't have to ask them anything about Lansing. You just need to ask them uh, what's their overall feeling about national politics. Uh, just as in 2018, uh, the Republican legislators were at the mercy of how people felt about Donald Trump. The same is true this year in 2022 for the Democratic le legislators uh, at the mercy of how people feel about Joe Biden. And this is the overtime uh, relationships. Uh, that is uh, the, how the president vo presidential vote goes uh, versus uh, state legislative vote. That's the uh, dash lines. Uh, this is the legislative approval relationship down here. So uh, people aren't necessarily getting better at uh, relating their votes to what's happening uh, at the state uh, level, but they are getting much better at uh, uh, voting for the same candidates uh, in uh, the national level. Uh, and at the state level and at the local level. These trends are the same basically across all levels of office. That is, people's votes are becoming increasingly correlated, geographic areas are becoming increasingly correlated, uh, and so uh, we have uh, a pretty nationalized partisan elections. Now remember, that does not mean somebody votes the same way in every single election, right? We saw that jaggedness. There's some discontent whenever a new party gets into power. We see both turnout and vote choice moving in the opposite direction of the party in power. So we get some different election outcomes, but that's because we're very close. We're uh, close to 50-50, uh, and we see some change back and forth. But if I'm going to change, if I'm upset with what the Democrats are doing now, I'm going to be upset with Democrats across the board, not just uh, with Democrats in D.C. Uh, this is a more complicated graph that shows you the same thing is happening with gubernatorial elections, with governor elections, but it's a return to normalcy. That is, we just had this period in the middle part of the 20th century where people were voting for their governor uh, separately than voting uh, for president, and uh, we've returned to a period where people are basically supporting either the Republicans or Democrats uh, for both of those uh, offices. Um, 
So that's increasing, we're seeing increasing associations at all geographic levels uh, between people's vote uh, for uh, president and uh, their uh, vote uh, for governor. Um, we think most of nationalization is about the media. People are paying more attention to national media and less attention to local and state media. Uh, just as one example, fewer people today know who their governor is than have in the past, but more people know who the vice president is than have in the past. So uh, it's not that people are getting less information, they're just getting different information, and that different information is mostly not about what you all are doing, uh, but mostly about what's happening in Washington, D.C. Uh, we said that there's a trend uh, overall that the party out of the presidency does better uh, in uh, midterm uh, elections. Uh, that's been especially true in Michigan. Uh, the party out of the presidency uh, has won the Michigan gubernatorial election in the midterm 18 out of the last 21 times. However, there is a, uh, a corresponding uh, thing that, that, so that would make us uh, negative on Whitmer winning re-election, but the corresponding thing on the other side would be the, that person has used usually also been the incumbent. The incumbent has won one re-election. So the incumbent has usually won re-election, but the party out of power and the presidency has usually, won re has usually won election. And so those two things are cutting against each other, those two historical patterns. This year, where we have an incumbent governor, but it is, it's uh, with an incumbent president of the same political party. But you can see this has also been true in legislative gains. Uh, so in the past, uh, the party out of the pa party of the presidency has gained not only only in Michigan gubernatorial elections, but also in Michigan House and Senate elections. All right, but we've also seen a lot of geographic change. Oh, this is what we tested earlier, and I was hoping we could, we could make it work. Uh, are you able to advance it, the video? Click it. Click it? All right, here we go. We have overtime data. So this is um, overtime data in, we didn't get to 2020, but we got, oops, can I go back? Try and watch it again. This is presidential vote. Just showing you uh, that uh, in 1992, you could, blue is Democrat, red is Republican. You can see that there was a lot of uh, diversity throughout Michigan uh, in the 90s in terms of uh, support for Democratic and Republican candidates in the 1992 presidential election. You can see some ups and downs. Um, but you can just trust me that 2020 looks almost exactly like 2016. The Democrats do slightly better, of course, they won, but uh, it, it's basically the same geographic pattern. That is, we have gotten to a, a very geographically polarized electorate uh, where the Democratic Party is hugely concentrated in urban areas and in the suburban areas most closely proximate to those urban areas. So um, that's something you probably all, all know, but um, the, to, to see how much change, how much geographic change we have seen just since the 90s uh, in that pattern in Michigan uh, is, is pretty uh, enormous. So overall, we have stability in terms of uh, the people making decisions about which political party to support, and yet we have this large geographic change uh, over time in uh, how people are uh, voting. Uh, and so you can see that, yes, it always was true that rural areas were more likely to be Republican or has been true for many decades, but it is extremely true uh, now uh, in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, this is also reflected in county uh, data that Derek uh, sent me uh, for after the last election. Um, uh, obviously, we have a few counties uh, that are 100% Democrat. Uh, we have uh, lots of counties that have no uh, Democratic representation. Uh, and so uh, on those previous maps, you can see I've done the county breakdown here, and it has the same um, pattern as, uh, uh, as the overall electorate. That is, Democrats are very concentrated geographically. So same thing is true in opinions of Whitmer. This is from our uh, uh, survey data combined with demographic data where we try to estimate uh, people's opinion of the governor based on uh, statewide survey data. Where do people love the governor? Here in Ingham County, in Washtenaw County, uh, not as much uh, in uh, some other uh, parts of, of the state. And yet, Michigan elections are considered extremely competitive uh, uh, this year. That is, people who rate uh, national uh, elections, legislative chambers most likely to flip, have both Michigan chambers uh, within the top 10 uh, nationwide out of 99 chambers, uh, not all of them are up, 
but uh, you can see we're on a very small list of chambers with some, with some chance of switching uh, from uh, the party currently in control to the party not in control, which would be from the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the governor's race is not rated as as high, as as competitive, uh, but that's because Whitmer is considered more secure uh, than uh, other uh, governors uh, nationally in this uh, era. So why is it uh, that uh, we have a chance uh, for the legislative control to flip uh, in favor of the party of the president, which I just said is basically unheard of in Michigan history? So there's no secret. Someone can tell me. What? Donald Trump, okay, we can frame Trump. Any, any other? Redistricting, yes. So uh, this is the redistricting cycle. Redistricting cycles always um, uh, lead uh, to more uh, variation than we might uh, expect to see because the districts have changed. Incumbents, for example, incumbent performance goes down in redistricting cycles because they have no new voters. Uh, so there's more of a chance for change than usual in redistricting. But of course, there is a lot of chance for change this year because we had a uh, redistricting uh, uh, process that was very different, uh, controlled by the Independent Commission uh, this year. Uh, this is a national... Um, a rating of this by uh, 538, a website that I am a contributor to, uh, of uh, the partisan breakdown of Michigan State House and State Senate uh, maps. You can still you can see that there are still more seats that are sort of reliably Republican than reliably Democrat, uh, but uh, that both of those have gone down uh, from the old map to the new map. That is, uh, there's going to be competition, and the competition is going to be potentially more favorable. Uh, to uh, Democrats in the new redistricting process. Uh, I was, I helped educate the Citizens Redistricting Commission. I got the, I, I was with them when they uh, did their first mapping practice. We practiced on Ohio, so as not to mess up Michigan. Uh, on the other hand, I was also uh, auth a co-author of a report with a lot of uh, data that they didn't like as much uh, later on in the process. So uh, I followed this uh, process quite closely. Um, this is an analysis um, that I think explains uh, a lot about uh, where the, the parties came down on redistricting. Uh, this is a map of a partisan fairness metric, and a zero would mean uh, that if uh, each party got 52%, uh, of the statewide vote, they would be equally likely to control the legislature. If each party got 55% of the statewide vote, they'd be equally likely to control the legislature. Okay, so that's zero. The, uh, the uh, lines right here were the maps that the commission considered, so they're close to zero. The gray boxes, the, the, the chart there, uh, that's a computer simulation just uh, that we ran just um, drawing random equal population districts in Michigan. So we just had the, the, uh, the computer just say, we need 110 districts of this size, uh, uh, draw them for us, and we did that 100,000 times. And then this uh, is the distribution of uh, partisan fairness metrics that came up on, uh, on those uh, districts. So um, what, what does somebody interpret that uh, for me? What is that saying? Did, were these maps fair? Can someone give me the Democratic perspective that these maps were fair? Like low-D Democrat? Because they seem that way. So 0% is like totally fair again? I'm sorry. Zero percent would mean that, yes, if, you were, if you got, the parties got exactly the same amount of the statewide vote, they'd be exactly as likely to... They're very close to zero, right? Okay. Somebody uh, give me the more Republican perspective on the the maps. They really, really had to try hard to do that, right? To get to uh, close to zero. Remember, just drawing randomly, they would have gotten maps that really favor the Republicans, right? So they drew maps that were more pro-democratic than 95% of randomly drawn maps would have been, right? Why? For that same geographic representation issue that we just talked about, right? So in order to, no, no, it's not getting me to the 2016 map, but you'll see. There we are. In order to uh, draw a map that is fair, in other words, would get us equally likely to elect Democrats and Republicans. What did the commission have to do? Well, they had to draw a bunch of districts that weren't just here, right? If you draw 90% districts here, then you only have a, a small number of districts that are Democrat. They're very Democrat, but uh, they don't get 
uh, very many total seats, right? So they had to draw lines in and out of all of those geographic areas to get uh, as many districts as they could that had a chance for Democrats to gain election. So, that, excuse me, yes. That help explain then why there are so many splits this time? It does, yes. So they had as a criteria not splitting counties. Uh, we have an analysis that showed that they did much worse than you would expect from randomly drawn maps. We're taking that into consideration. However, um, they had a higher cri pri criteria in their defense, uh, which was uh, to uh, make for statewide partisan fairness. Uh, they interpreted that to basically mean get as close to zero on these metrics as you, as you can. Okay, so we can understand a little bit why both parties might be slightly upset about this. Democrats could say, well, they had a chance to get to zero, and they should have. Republicans uh, would say, well, look, they had to try really hard, really dr mess up the lines in order to get to uh, a, uh, a level of partisan fairness that they were comfortable with. Does that make sense? So both those things are true. They're both true. Uh, all right. So they also had a very unusual uh, uh, compliance strategy with the Voting Rights Act, which you all know about, but I thought I would remind you uh, with, with some graphical information. Uh, they, uh, it, we used to have districts which were majority-minority districts uh, and a lot of districts where they had very few minority voters. Now we have a lot more districts with between, with about 40% minority voters. And that is for a very specific reason. That was the commission's criteria. They decided uh, through their lawyers uh, that they needed to focus on maximizing the number of around 40% African-American districts, and that's what they did. They listened to their lawyers. Now, that turned out to be quite different uh, than uh, what most other states did. Most other states just drew some majority-minority districts uh, and uh, then uh, uh, let the rest be less. So the, the box plots there are, the again, the randomly drawn maps. So you can see if you're randomly drawing maps, you're going to draw a lot of districts that are almost, not a lot, you're going to draw two or three districts that are overwhelmingly African-American in the city of Detroit, right? And then you're going to draw a, a lot of other districts which are lower, right? So from an African-American representation perspective, that means that they're virtually guaranteed to have representation for the majority preferred candidate of the African-American vote in a few districts, but that they won't have that power in lots of districts, right? Whereas the new system, they potentially have some chance to influence the outcome in lots of districts, but they have almost no guarantees. Does that make sense? So we're about to have a big test of this, the primaries, uh, in a week, uh, because uh, African-American voters would have to win those primaries as well as win uh, the general election. This, a lot of people think this was about the partisan fairness metric that I just mentioned. I will, com I will uh, say that it really wasn't. They mostly drew districts, they mostly drew districts replacing black Democrats with white Democrats in those districts. So those districts are still quite likely to be Democratic, that are 40% African-American, but uh, they are less likely up here and maybe more likely up here to have the African-American preferred candidate win those districts. So we, are, uh, we have a very different uh, set of elections uh, this year in Michigan, and it's almost all entirely because of the redistricting commission and the criteria that they were following. Now, in each of these cases, you could make the argument that they were following the criteria that the voters gave them, but each of them was also dependent on some lawyers' interpretations, which were quite, you know, distinct from other others' interpretations, and that's why there's been uh, quite a few lawsuits following it. But we're on it now. All right, any questions about the redistricting stuff? Everybody understand the basic pattern? We have Republicans should be favored out year election, uh, but here we just redrew the lines and we drew them in a way that is much more favorable to Democrats, not necessarily biased in favor of Democrats, but much more favorable to Democrats than the previous maps. So when did it get about the political parties and not about the people that listen? Uh, I would say it has always been um, uh, about the political parties. Remember, there was partisans drawing them in the past, um, and they were trying to maximize party representation as well. Um, but uh, they were, I would say, able to maximize other kinds of criteria in doing that, right? So if you're a Republican, you want to say that it's very important 
to uh, take advantage of local government boundaries, make sure local government boundaries uh, stay in one district. Uh, you would say you want, you don't want any awkward looking districts, right? You want districts to be basically circles and squares. Uh, and those criteria, I'm not knocking those criteria, I'm just telling you those criteria are gonna move you out further here on the distribution so that in the statewide vote, Republicans don't need as many votes to win a majority in the legislature. So I, I wouldn't say either one was sort of free of, of partisan data. Um, they're just using different criteria. Does that make sense? I'm not saying this is the only, yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, but you just say that it's going to favor the Republican that way, but the same is true within cities where you've got a whole bunch of districts and they're all controlled by Democrats. Uh, yeah, so part of that is just, you know, we have... We, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. They didn't hear it online. Go ahead. Okay. So you had Republicans on, on the one side that you said favor, and the Dems on the other side. But the same is true in the big cities. You've got a bunch of districts all controlled by the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And then outside those, you've got the Republicans. I mean... Right, but there's no area in Michigan that is as Republican as, as Detroit is Democratic. Right, so you're you're not going to have any districts that are uh, as uh, as completely democratic as uh, those districts in Detroit. If you just drew them, small districts uh, that were completely encapsulated by the city, uh, and so that means on a statewide basis, that's why we say Democrats are going to waste more votes. In other words, get well above 50 percent in those districts. Republicans are therefore going to win more of the districts that are going to have more people in the districts that are 60, 65 percent uh, Republican rather than 90 percent Republican, right? So that's the basic geography that's at work here. Uh, and I'm not, when I say, well, I'm just saying according to this definition of bias that the, that the commission was using, there are other people who would say what it is bias to move it off of here the middle of the distribution towards the Democrats. That's the Republicans' argument, is that this was a biased map because they were trying to move it off what natural geography would, would give you. Okay, so I'm just telling you both those things are true. They didn't get completely to unbiased from the Democratic metric uh, that it would be equally likely to enact, uh, to elect Democrats or Republicans to control if the statewide vote was 50-50, but uh, they got much closer to that than you would expect from Michigan geography. Yes? What's the registration breakdown? Republican Statewide, I don't know the current numbers. Um, we're still more Democratic than a Republican. Um, the, the, but that is going to be, remember, we don't register by party in the state. So that is based on analyses that take into consideration who voted in what primaries is basically our best proxy for that. And it's not a great one. There's still a lot of people who don't vote in either primary. Uh, and so um, you don't know what party they're in. You have to guess. Um, all right, so we also had very high turnout in 2018 and 2020. So this is uh, turnout, uh, national turnout over time. Um, you can see that uh, 2018 was the highest midterm turnout in at least 50 years, and uh, 2020 was the highest presidential turnout also in at least 50 years. So we had extremely high turnout uh, elections uh, in the last two. I do not know whether that means we're going to have high turnout in 2022, uh, and we'll see one indication uh, in uh, uh, the primary election. Um, so far, we've continued to have more than normal primary turnout, but there's not in historically a huge relationship between the primary turnout uh, and the general election turnout. Now, everyone seems to believe that there's a big partisan advantage uh, associated with turnout. However, there is not. There is no relationship whatsoever between how many people vote and whether Democrats or Republicans win. Everyone believes there is. Uh, both parties uh, believe that they can jigger the rules to uh, adjust turnout, and that will make some difference in uh, whether Democrats or Republicans uh, are likely to win. But there's no uh, relationship either in uh, on-year elections or off-year elections in midterms or presidential elections between how many people total vote and whether Republicans or Democrats uh, win. That doesn't mean that turnout doesn't matter. It's differential turnout that matters, right? Which party is more uh, motivated to uh, show up to vote? 
But a lot of people also believe that there's a trade-off, that if I can mobilize my base, then maybe that's worth losing some swing voters. I'll lose some swing voters and mobilize my base, right? Why doesn't that work? You also mobilize the other side's base, right? Donald Trump, excellent motivator for Republican votes, but way more than that excellent motivator for Democratic votes, right? So uh, the issue uh, with motivating one side is that you often motivate the other side. Uh, and overall, uh, turnout and vote choice move in the same direction. That is, when swing voters are moving towards one side, that side is also usually gaining in, di in differential turnout. Right. If Republica, if the median voter is moving against Republicans, re Democrats are also more likely to turn out uh, and uh, vice versa. So everyone thinks we can change the course of the election with turnout, but there's no overall relationship. And uh, to the extent that you're changing turnout, it's usually in the same direction uh, as you're moving swing voters. All right. How, how, what is our new time to... You're, you're fine. You can run all the way into oh, 2 Oh, don't say that, because I have way, I have a lot of slides. You know, you don't want it that long. Uh, uh, polls close at 2. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, this is uh, the overall change uh, in uh, uh, county vote uh, from 2016 to uh, 2020 nationwide. Um, so you can see some important trends there, but I want to uh, first tell you that the correlation is 0.99 out of 1, right? So if you want to know how a place voted in 2020 and you already know how they voted in 2016, you pretty much know how they voted in 2020. It's an extremely strong relationship. But that does not mean that there were no changes. There were some changes. I just want to set it up by saying most people and most places are not changing uh, how they're voting from one election to the other. However, we did see some changes, um, and they um, follow the same changes that we saw in uh, 2016 to some extent, and there was one notable difference. The, the one that followed the same trends that we've been seeing for the last four elections is that white college-educated voters move towards the Democrats, and white voters without college degrees move towards the Republicans. That was also true of the 2016 election, and it was true again in the 2018 election, and then true again in the 2020 election. So there's been a big increasing divide based on education level. That does not mean that we believe that it was actually attendance at college that made someone a Democrat. In part, that we, we don't think that because it happened, for the most part, long after they left college, right? So these people are changing their votes. We can predict their changes based on whether they have a college degree or not, but we're not saying they entered college and then they voted differently, right? This is 20, for the most part, for the average voter, 20 years after uh, leaving, uh, they made these uh, changes. The other change, which was much more specific to the 2020 election, is gains among Hispanic voters uh, by Republicans. So obviously this was very visible in South Florida and South Texas, um, but it was visible including in very small Hispanic populations, including in Michigan, uh, and basically all over the place where you had any kind of Hispanic population concentration, you saw a little bit of move toward uh, Republicans. Um, the, I would say the, the most supported so far explanation of that is that we saw more uh, what we call ideological sorting. And all that means is conservatives voted for the Republican candidate and liberals voted for the Democratic candidate. That might seem obvious to us. However, it took us you know, 30, 40 years to get to a place where that, that was a very strong predictor of who you were going to vote for, Democratic or Republican. And there weren't very many liberal Republicans or conservative Democrats. But in the Hispanic population, that is still true. There are still a lot of conservative Hispanic Democrats. And so that population is in slow decline. Conservative Hispanics are increasingly moving toward the Republican Party. Um, you also can see actually liberal Hispanics move slightly towards the Democratic Party. So that's why I say it's sorting. There's just a lot more conservative uh, than liberal identifying Hispanic voters. And uh, there also is just a high level of Democratic support in the Hispanic population. So that's why the sorting is going to be good for Republicans. Right. If people are vote, uh, voting based on their ideological ident identity, uh, then they are uh, going to, to vote Republican. This has been a long dream among Republicans for black voters, 
right? Because at the point when you're at 90% of black voters supporting the Democratic candidate, that means that you have people who believe themselves to be conservative, are conservative on economic policy, and are conservative on social issues who are still voting Democratic, right? And so if you think about kind of the median African-American voter in Michigan and nationwide, you're talking about a very conservative person, somebody who might be uh, on the edge of supporting a Democratic or Republican candidate. But historically, those people have still supported Democrats uh, via the belief that Democrats are more associated with the, the, uh, with the, with the uh, with their racial group and with uh, outcomes for their racial group. That's true to some extent, but a much less extent among Hispanic voters. So there's sort of room, more room to grow, at least so far, among Hispanic voters for Republicans. All right, uh, how are we looking in 2022? Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do associate myself with a website that claims to, so I'll tell you what they say. Um, they are giving an extremely high chance of uh, Governor Whitmer winning uh, re-election right now. It was a 93% when I made this slide. That's basically just showing you that the polls are showing uh, Whitmer favored this time. Um, I would argue a lot of that is that people don't know the Republican candidates. Um, so it is entirely possible, it is, it's more than possible, it's likely that that margin will close as we get closer to the election, whoever the Republican candidate is. Uh, but we do have some elections where the candidate did matter. So overall, the more experienced candidates do better in general elections. That's always been true. It's true to a lesser degree now, but it is still true. So, you know, your best candidate for governor has historically been the attorney general or the lieutenant governor. Those were the two candidates competing for the last <laughs> Republican nomination. <laughs> that is very different than this time, right? We have five candidates with no experience who no one's ever heard of. And uh, those uh, candidates should do worse than the, gov the lieutenant governor or the attorney general uh, would do. So some of this low performance is due to we don't know them yet, and we expect that part to lead to a close. Uh, but some of that is due to uh, the candidates actually being you know, less experienced and less well-known uh, than the previous uh, candidates. Um, we just... Uh, this actually just, they just changed this based on the campaign finance reports to be um, a, a equal likelihood or no lean uh, for controlling uh, the, the House, the Michigan House of Representatives. But this is uh, a uh, depiction of who's likely to win in uh, various House districts. Um, uh, that uh, campaign finance, which this is an updated from, uh, but was better for Democrats uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the state House and Senate districts, um, uh, surprisingly so in the, in the Senate. Uh, and is leading some people to change their predictions about the likelihood of Democratic uh, control. Uh, I am still skeptical uh, of that. I think you should expect things to move toward Republicans uh, as we get closer to Election Day. Um, but the polls and the fundraising numbers so far are supporting more of an even uh, likelihood. However, the polls might be wrong. <laughs> uh, in fact, the polls are are wrong. They're just not consistently wrong in the same direction. Now, they have been wrong uh, in the last two elections in the same direction. You can see we're up here, see Michigan. The polls were uh, six points too Democratic in 2016, five points too Democratic in 2020. Great news for Republicans, we can just simply add five points to the current poll, and then we'll have the Republican standing, right? Well, in 2012, they were three points too Republican. And in 2008, they were three points to Republicans. So if we had done that in 2016 and added three points to the Democratic share, we would have been even further off, right? So it could be the case that we're in a new polling era where Republicans are, more, are less likely to respond to polls than our Democrats, and that's the basis for these polling errors. Uh, or it could be that polls are just less predictable now. Remember, we're talking about response rates in media polls that are probably 2 to 5%. So of the people that they call, they are only talking to 2 to 5% of them. We know that the refusal rate is correlated with all kinds of things, like whether you trust the government, whether you trust a university that might be doing the polling. Uh, and uh, yet, you know, and so we try to adjust for those things, but it is quite difficult uh, to do so, especially where you don't have some basic grounding. So if you know how many African Americans there are in the state, how many people with a college degree are in the state, we can wait to those kinds of things. But we don't really know how many people are untrusting of 
the polling organization in the state. That's an unknown number, so we can't wait to, to that. So uh, the basic bottom line recommendation is usually whenever you hear a uh, polling result and they tell you the margin of error is 4%, you need to at least double that margin of error to get the range of polls that have historically been in line with the actual election result. And if you're thinking about betting on, say, the GOP primary race, I would go a lot further than that doubling, because there you're dealing with not just did we interview the right people, but do they know who they're going to vote for in a week? They might not. So uh, you have uh, issues that are much bigger in an, in an election where um, it's not just a choice between Republicans and Democrats. All right, any questions on 2022? I have more graphs, don't you worry. No. <laughs> I'll jump in okay, here real quick, it. Matt. Uh, going back to where the fallacy on higher turnout creates certain results, mm -hmm. uh, has the industry found that, uh, is there any guidance, from example, from Australia where you have mandatory voting and what effect that has on uh, partisan voting behavior? And then also uh, from the UK, which is a political culture that has been more ideologically uh, sorted uh, for a much longer period than what we are in now. Um, is there any guidance there in their behavior that helps us figure out what we're in now as far as, you know, what turnout, you know, turnout does blank? Help uh, why or help <laughs> in, in systems with higher turnout, there's not a strong relationship between left or right voting versus systems with lower turnout. Um, there, there is a difference in basically fewer, less informed people will vote. So if you raise the turnout rate, you're getting less and less and less informed people. And that means they swing more from one side to the other. Um, it also means that they have more mixed opinions. So you'd see more people who are, say, socially conservative and economically liberal or the reverse, um, but not an overall advantage for one party versus the other. Oh, and the UK, the UK um, is actually going through basically these same changes at the same time we are. So things are aligning with the Brexit vote, um, which lined up basically the same way. So although they are stable ideologically, perhaps, they're not stable demographically. They're showing these big divisions based on education level. With, with, with the unknown of the, of the governors running and the amount of people that have, have um, not voted yet because undecided, will that, will that change our, our uh, outcome much? That just means that it's a lot more uncertain, right? So that means the polling error should be larger. That means that, um, you know, somebody who's 10 points down uh, is still a potential winner um, because you have a polling error that's large, plus you have the capacity for people to change their opinions. Um, and that's usually polls um, will try to move undecided peoples, and, and that's good because you don't want to put out a poll where you say 30% of people are going to vote for Whitmer and 30% for the Republican candidate and the rest are undecided. So usually they'll ask a follow-up question, but it turns out that follow-up question is less reliable, right? So if you didn't know right away who you're voting for in the Republican primary and I made you, made you say, well, who are you leaning toward? Your lean is less predictable. Hi, uh, Chris Mattis from Wayne County. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone will in, uh, indulge me in a bit of a selfish question. Who do you think is going to win the uh, 13th uh, Democratic Congressional primary? <laughs> uh, Stevens, but I'm not, I don't have like a strong. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I meant the one with uh, the, the wide open one. How oh, oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do that one. <laughs> so, yeah. The, the, yeah, these, you know, primaries are very, uh, are a lot less predictable. Um, we used to be able to have a good prediction for who was going to win the primary, and it was just simply who the most experienced candidate was and who got the most endorsements uh, from interest groups and party-linked uh, outfits and former elected officials. Uh, and that used to have just an extremely strong relationship uh, with who won those primaries. So who, tell us who that would be in, in, if, if we're going well, by that. Wayne County, I mean, to your point, Wayne County's a big mixture, too. Yeah. Brenda Lawrence, the outgoing incumbent, yeah. endorsed. Evans has endorsed a candidate along with the mayor of Detroit. So anyone, I mean, it's all across the board there as well. City council members have different endorsements. 
And to your point about not necessarily needing the majority, the winner of that primary could just right. get like 20% They only need 15 or 20%. Vote, percent. Yeah. And they're going to Congress in the fall based mm -hmm. on the, the sorting. And just, so it, it'll be really interesting. Yep. Anyway. So. I don't know what else is coming here. So, so uh, no, but it's a good example of what we're talking about is, you know, these, get, these primaries are wide open. Now, it turns out that um, Republican primaries are even less uh, easy to predict uh, than Democratic primaries, in part because the less experienced candidates are winning a lot more. Uh, than they used to. It used to be the case in both parties that, you know, your best candidate for Congress was the state senator, the best candidate for state senate was the state house member, the best state house member was the county commissioner, you know, went, went down the, the way. Um, and that's just not as obviously true anymore. It still is uh, there's still a relationship, um, but there's especially less of a relationship in Republican primaries than there used to be. Uh, there's more support for amateur, what we call amateur candidates, just hit you, people who haven't been previously elected. Uh, all right, there's also ideology, uh, obviously, driving primary election outcomes more than uh, they have in the past. Um, I said it used to just be, you know, who's the most experienced candidate. Uh, now it often is about ideological alignment uh, with uh, the primary electorate, but that is much truer in the Republican primary than the Democratic primary. Republican primaries are much more about uh, running to the right, who's the most conservative candidate today, who's the most aligned with Donald Trump potentially, uh, than uh, they have been in the past. And there's a reason for that, which is that Republican primary electorates are much more conservative than the general electorate. That is true to a limited extent on the Democratic side. In other words, obviously, the median voter in the Democratic primary is going to be to the left of the median voter in the general election. And so there's, that is also true in the Republican and the Democratic Party. But it's really true in the Republican Party. Republican primary electorates are extremely conservative relative to the, the median voter. And that is true no matter how you assess that. Their self-identity, their issue positions, uh, anything along those lines. And so it's so far been something that has um, affected the Republican Party more than the Democratic primary. But of course, we're seeing several races in, in our state this year on the Democratic side that are uh, ideologically divided. So um, we Did might see. Conclude, yeah. Then, yeah. That, that you had cited the education level mm -hmm. versus college and, and you know, non college. Yep. Is Uh, that's right. Um, that's right. But unfortunately, you know, I'm a professor, so I'm going to complicate it. Uh, actually, we have changes in the population as a whole, right? And so there are many more people with college degrees. So in fact, the composition of the Republican Party hasn't really changed. If you look at it as like percentage of people in the Republican Party who have a college degree versus used to, there's actually not much change. It's the Democrats where the huge change is because we have Democrats doing better among college educated voters at the same time that there are more college educated voters. And so you have this very long-term decline in non-college white voters among the Democratic electorate. Okay. Uh, Matt, a question off from online, Phil Morris in Oceanic County. He noted or wanted your feedback on the fact that redistricting now has basically stripped the incumbent tag off of folks who are running and whether that's going to have an outsize effect on the results that we're going to see uh, in August and November. Uh, yes, yeah, so incumbents are doing, do worse in all redistricting cycles. Incumbents do worse, both in primary elections and general elections, uh, than in non-post redistricting cycles. But we're talking about usually a little bit worse, right? This year, they have very different districts. One of the criteria that the commission was supposed to use was to not favor or disfavor an incumbent. They interpreted that, again, a somewhat of an idiosyncratic interpretation, to mean pay zero attention to where any incumbent lives. And they did that, okay? And so uh, you have lots of districts where multiple incumbents are running or where there was no incumbent, where someone moved or uh, where, you know, it's open, open season. And so, yeah, that's going to make the elections both more unpredictable but also possibly more related to these kinds of, of trends, like who's the most ideologically consistent with the primary electorate. All right. Uh, Okay, so what about the relationship between governing and election outcomes? 
Maybe this is about the voters rewarding people for good or bad governance. Well, in a sense, that is true, but people often get this relationship wrong. Okay? They think Obama was elected to enact Obamacare. So he enacts Obamacare. He should get popular. People should love him. He fulfilled his campaign promise. Okay? Trump was elected to get rid of Obamacare. So he really tried to get rid of Obamacare. That should have been very popular, and he should have gained from that. Okay? No, of course, the opposite happened. Right? As you are moving policy leftward, public opinion is moving rightward. As you're moving policy rightward, public opinion is moving leftward. So uh, under Ronald Reagan, we think about that as a time of great conservatism. Actually, public opinion was moving leftward during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Under Bill Clinton, it was moving rightward. Under Donald Trump, it was moving leftward. Under Joe Biden, it's probably moving rightward. Okay? So generally, we see both a general reaction against the party of the president in public opinion, and I don't just mean in voting, I also mean in, are you conservative or liberal? Do you think we should raise or lower taxes? Any way that you ask people questions, all those things are related to the party of the president and how much the party of the president has been able to move policy in their preferred direction. So where were the biggest uh, midterm uh, uh, losses for the president's party? 1966, after LBJ, 1994, in 2010, those were the biggest shifts against the president's party. Well, what did those follow? Well, those, fo those were periods of liberal success, right? That was a lot of liberal policymaking. Not all of it successful in 1994, uh, as, we, as we remember. But the more Democratic presidents were able to move policy leftward, the, more, the bigger the backlash, right? The more that public opinion and election results uh, moved rightward in uh, response. Part of that is because there is sort of a basis for each political party to claim that they are a majority or at least plurality of the electorate. There are more Democrats than Republicans, both nationally and in Michigan. There long have been. There are also more conservatives than liberals in nationally and in Michigan. Okay, so what, what does that mean? That must mean there's a lot of Democrats who are not liberals right? Or there's a lot of people in the middle who lean more towards the Democrats, but also consider themselves more conservative than liberal, right? It turns out both of those things are true. Within the Democratic identifiers, there are more people who are moderates than within the Republican identifiers. And the, uh, within the middle population, you have a lot of people who think of themselves as more conservative than liberal, but think of their attachment as more to the Democratic Party, as closer to the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Okay, so there is sort of a basis for each party to kind of have a um, uh, plurality support, um, but uh, also uh, very different bases of support. Kind of going along with that, there's also differences in public opinion based on how broadly you ask people questions. The more specific you ask questions, the more likely people are to give you a liberal answer. The more general you ask a question, the more likely people are to give you a conservative answer. And that has long been true. It's true in other countries, but it's disproportionately true in the U.S. So we all know this from government spending, right? Government spending, popular or unpopular? Well, overall, it's unpopular. Government spending on any X, almost any X, popular, right? Same thing is true of regulation. Regulation, popular or unpopular? Unpopular. Regulation on almost any X popular. Okay, same is even true in social issues. People consider themselves culturally conservative even if they have changed their opinions more in favor of gay rights than they were 10 years ago. Even if they've moved their opinion in favor of marijuana uh, legalization in the last 10 or 20 years. Both those opinions have moved quite liberal over time and yet people are still considering themselves more culturally conservative. They still answer questions like, is society uh, undermining traditional values in a conservative direction? Is society move, changing too fast uh, more in a conservative direction? So general views give you conservative answers. Specific views give you liberal answers. That's why Republicans tend to talk in broader terms about the size and scope of government and the direction of society. And Democrats tend to talk in specific terms about what they are going to do for particular constituencies, because that's where their advantages are. 
Now, both of these things move against the party of the president and move against policymaking, right? So you can see uh, after Bill Clinton gets in charge, policy mood, that's, uh, that's the specifics, size and scope of government, both disproportionately liberal to get, help get Clinton elected. He starts making policy. Public opinion moves quickly to the right in both of those metrics. So we have the gap, but we also have the change over time moving against uh, the direction of policy. And that's one reason why, and it just happened under Trump, this ends under Trump, right? And public opinion is moving liberal. There are more people identifying as liberal, there are more people uh, saying that it's better for the government to be bigger and have more services, even though that's still a minority, and there are more people saying we want more government spending on education, health care, etc. Right? So this is, this is basically simplified. This is the percentage of people who give you the liberal answer out of all of the liberal or conservative answers uh, on the average polling question, averaging over thousands of polling questions. And this is just the broadest questions. And so that's why you get that gap, but you also get that, that shift. Does that make sense? How each party has sort of a basis in public opinion that allows them to, to come back, especially when the other party is in power. Thoughts, questions about that? Uh, Matt, just to circle back on that, um, so the, the thermostatic response, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, opinion swings against whoever's trying See, to Derek take reads academic literature. He's using words like <laughs> thermostatic. Sorry. He knows. Um, so you, I believe you mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a similar uh, dynamic seen in other democratic societies, small d democratic societies, but it is not as strong as here. Is, is that correct? Um, there is a, a similar pattern. Um, uh, it's pretty similar overall across societies. That is that you're going to see uh, liberal movement under conservative rule and conservative movement under liberal rule pretty much in any democracy. What is different in the U.S. is this gap, right? So this gap is bigger here. There's more, uh, there are more people who you might say are we might say are confused if we wanted, but we could just say they have different sets of attitudes. On the one hand, they think that government is too big, it's trying to do too much, and it's changing society too fast. But at the very same time, they agree with a bunch of those changes, and they want government to act in all kinds of specific areas. And we have that population is bigger in the United States than elsewhere. And so what is the what does that do to the incentive structure? For example, most of the people in this room are... Uh, locally elected officials, and so they get elected, and their incentive, if they want to get reelected, would be not to do anything. Is that actually the kind of the political incentive structure? Yes, Joe Manchin might save the Democrats. No, um, the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, yes. Overall, there's a relationship between how much you do to move policy in your ideological direction. Now, keep in mind, we might have um, some changes which might not be seen as big moves in their their ideological direction. So, just for example, the Democrats do well in 1998 uh, midterm election, and even though Bill Clinton is in charge, he's with the Republicans enacting a small number of things like tax cuts. Um, and so it could be that there's an incentive to do more bipartisan things, which I will use this as a way to get, wait, am I going backwards? I'm going backwards. Get to another one of my slides, which is to say, actually most things are still done in bipartisan ways, which you all probably know. Um, because that's true in state legislatures and local governments, but it's also even true in Congress. I don't have uh, Trump's last time, time on here, but actually uh, the, last, the very last Congress, every significant policy change that was passed had majority support from both Democrats and Republicans. So we know the COVID bills, right? But everything else that passed also had majority support from Democrats and Republicans. It had to, because it was divided government. Um, but it turns out that that's the norm. And I'm not even... Using, I'm not, it's not easy to be bipartisan on my graph, right? So even the infrastructure bill doesn't count as bipartisan because it didn't have a majority support by Republicans in either the House or the Senate, right? So most things are bipartisan, not just in having a few small number of uh, people on the other side, but actually having majority support from both political parties. So those kinds of things don't tend to cause the same backlash. It's right here, 1994, 2010, 
and uh, 2018 to some extent when the parties in power is trying to do things on their own that are clearly moving it in its ideological direction that leads to the backlash. And I have a five minute warning. Okay. Other questions? Uh, I, I still think, you mean the state house or the U.S. house? US house. Um, I think Republicans are likely to take over the house. It's just too small of a margin for Democrats. Uh, and, uh, you know, you only need two to three point shift in the national vote to get uh, Republicans. Uh, similar, I would say, um, you know, there's more of a chance because I think a lot of those redistricting areas are more open um, than, than the U.S. house. But I still think. There's the yes, the, the current maps mean that if Democrats were to win the statewide vote, they'd be very likely to win. Um, but I, I think the chance that they win the statewide vote is, is not that high. What does the public think today about the redistricting, and do you think that will change after the election? They um, can articulate some specific complaints, but they all, not all. A lar very large majority, I think 80% in our polling, thinks that it's substantially better than the previous system. So they're, they're pretty happy overall, despite what has been in-state press coverage, not that positive about the commission. Um, but uh, in terms of whether that will change, we, we've been surveying it for a year and a half and haven't seen that much change. So I don't know that, I think people will basically be more happy than they were under the previous system. So what are the issues where Americans agree on where something that one party's doing is going to aggravate the other? What is it that we agree on as a country? There are a lot of individual issue positions that people agree on, but again, that's sort of biasing things toward Democrats because if you ask them, it, like on gun control, for example, you ask them 20 things that we should do to increase gun control, all of those things, not, not all, but most of those things are going to get much higher levels of public support than just asking them whether we should have more or less gun control. So therefore, a whole bunch of things that would increase gun control without, without that. And it turns out that um, ballot propositions, for example, tend to look actually more like the general position than the specific position. So over the course of a campaign, um, you know, Republicans are, in, in particular on guns, for example, many uh, uh, initiatives that started out with 75%, 80% support get to about 50-50 by the day of the election. So there are some things we agree on, at least in public opinion polls, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be uncontroversial if talked about in a campaign. In the Republican primary, I read both. Is it, what's going to, if Trump endorses, is it going to hurt or help? What do you think? For the governor's race? No. In a primary election, mm -hmm. it helps in a primary election overall. Um, but yeah, okay. yeah, but it, it, that doesn't mean that the Trump endorsed candidate is going to win because um, Trump is making some endorsements in places where he's against the rest of the party uh, or he's against the more experienced candidate. So that doesn't mean the Trump endorsement wins. But if you're saying like, what's the polling look like before and after the Trump endorsement? It's going to help. Two minutes. Okay, we can still do stuff if you want. Overall, the trend is still uh, negative for uh, Democrats. So just to give a sense, in 1992, Republicans controlled all of only three state governments. In other words, they had the House, the Senate, and the governors, uh, governorship in only three state governments nationwide. By 2017, they had a majority uh, of states where they had, um, uh, where they had complete uh, control. So... Across states, this geographic polarization has also meant that Republicans are doing better uh, in the average state, not necessarily the average voter, but the average state. And this is uh, de overall Democratic proportion of state houses and state senates. You can see, although there were these shifts that I was talking about, you know, 2006, 2008, 2018, there are shifts toward the Democrats, but there's still a long-term trend. Right? The long-term trend is downward for Democratic control of these places. It hasn't been good for Democrats. The geographic polarization has not been good for Democrats winning more seats uh, in state legislative races or any other kind of districted races like a county commission. Um, 
here's, I only have counties for the last few years, um, but this is uh, the Democratic counties won by the uh, uh, Democratic candidate. Nationally, the blue line and the orange line is Michigan. So Obama just did awesome in Michigan counties, right? He won all these places that Democrats don't normally win in 2008. But uh, Democrats are down to 10%, 15% of counties uh, that they're winning uh, at the presidential level in Michigan. And that reflects national trend, but you can see we, we are bumping up much more, uh, bumping up and down much more. So um, the overall trends in terms of geographic polarization have also met uh, a decline in uh, the Democrats. And people used to say that this was about the change in the South, and certainly the first part of it is. You had a whole bunch of Democratic state governments that were mostly in conservative states, and they became Republican state governments. And no, that didn't happen in the 70s. It happened in the 90s. And uh, so that was part of that trend. But then the South kept getting bigger and bigger. I'm from Missouri. We became part of the South. We joined the SEC. Uh, the, uh, you, you start to get all the way to where the South includes the UP of Michigan, you know, and then you're like, okay, it's, it's not really the South. It's that culturally conservative regions of the U.S. Um, are, are bigger, are more, there are more of them than culturally liberal regions. And as politics has become a little bit more about cultural issues relative to economic issues, you're seeing moves uh, in favor of Republicans, especially by geography. All right, I used all my two There we go. Thank you, Matt. Thanks.